Ladies and gentlemen, my introductory remarks will be a little bit longer than usual. Last weekend, I received the following letter, which I quote verbatim. Dear sir, for the past several months, we, as well as the rest of the American public, have been subjected to intense media coverage from a variety of sources regarding atrocities and war crimes allegedly uh, committed in the Republic of Vietnam. We have been <clears throat> confronted with numerous confessions and accusations from those who feel an overwhelming guilt about their participation in our involvement in Southeast Asia. Several of these individuals uh, claim to speak for all who have served on the grounds that the guilt is shared by all. We do not presume to speak for everyone, nor do we necessarily represent the stated views of the present administration or the United States Marine Corps. <clears throat> we are not at this time, nor have we ever, been members of any organization which was either for or against the Vietnam War. We have a total time of over three years in Vietnam, spanning the period from May 1968 to September 1970. We are company-grade officers presently on active duty in the Marine Corps Station in Quantico, Virginia. And the letter goes on, Captain John F. Bender, age 26, is a graduate of the Phillips Exeter Academy and Princeton University, where he majored in American diplomatic history. In the Republic of Vietnam, he served as an inf infantry officer. During this time, he participated in military operations as far west of Da Nang as the Laotian border and as far south as Hiep Duc in the Quezon Valley. He was awarded the Bronze Star for Heroic Action, the Navy Commendation Medal, the Navy Achievement Medal, and the Purple Heart. This summer, uh, Captain Bender leaves active duty to begin graduate studies at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, Captain Donald Carpenter, age 25, is a graduate of Phillips Andover Academy in Brown University, where he majored in English literature. Uh, initially assigned as an artillery Ford observer, he operated from south of Quezon to the DMZ. His personal decorations include the Bronze Star, Purple Heart, and the Navy Unit Citation. Uh, Captain Carpenter will be released from active duty this July and will attend the Harvard Graduate School of Business Administration. Uh, Captain Oliver North, age 27, is a graduate of the New York Public School System and the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland. His major course of study was foreign affairs. After graduating as an honor student, he served for nine and a half months as a rifle platoon commander from south of Danang to the DMZ. He has been awarded the Silver Star for gallantry and a Bronze Star for heroic action. He is also the recipient of two Purple Hearts for wounds received in conduct. Uh, in, in, con in combat, he intends to make the Marine Corps a career. And then the final paragraph of the letter. In light of the aforementioned qualifications, it is obvious that each of us has had ample opportunity to both lead and observe Americans in combat, yet none of us have ever witnessed, participated in, or been cognizant of a single instance wherein any Vietnamese non-combatant, North or South, was treated in anything less than a humane fashion. We believe that the American public should know this. Respectfully, John F. Bender, Donald B. Carpenter, Oliver L. North. Well, here you are. And I would like to begin by asking, did anybody put you up to writing me that letter? <laughs> well, I'll answer for that, not at all. We uh, got together at certain times, at basically we have some more jobs down here. And uh, we just one night began discussing it. And the fact that we've been subjected to this, the fact that personalities are involved in presenting this picture of mass atrocities, mass involvement. And we decided that, that since we had not seen this, and that we felt a number of people that have not seen this, that someone should get up and, <coughs> and say something. Well, in the last sentence of the letter that you wrote jointly, you said something which, um, it would seem to me, would render the letter 
are automatically suspect. When you said um, we are not cognizant of a single instance wherein any Vietnamese non-combatant North or South was treated in anything less than a humane fashion. But obviously you were cognizant of my lay, weren't you? Oh, can I answer that? Sure. I think that we were referring, Mr. Buckley, to our personal experience while we were in the Republic of Vietnam. In other words, <coughs> cognizant within our realm of action. In other words, I think we're obviously all aware of the Mille I incident. But I was, we were referring specifically to anything that came under our purview while we were in Vietnam. Well, Mille uh, was in March of, 19, uh, uh, of 1968, and it was not revealed until September 1969. So could this mean that there were a lot of Milais that you never heard of, but which you might momentarily hear about? Would that destroy uh, your own confidence in, in your own judgments as articulated in that letter? I don't think so. I, what motivated us primarily was the concern that the families of our own men uh, and myself, uh, thinking of the 216 uh, enlisted men that served in my rifle platoon over the nine and a half months that I commanded it, and the 17 officers who were uh, rotated through my company uh, while I was in Vietnam, some of whom were killed, most of whom were at least wounded. I felt personally that uh, I didn't want the families of any of those people to feel that their sons or their husbands were coming home as, quote, war criminals. Uh, my original motivation was just that, that uh, I thought it was becoming uh, a known fact almost throughout our country that anyone who had participated in the war was by the nature of the fact of his participation, a war criminal. Uh, what we say in, in the letter is that through <coughs> our experience over the three uh, plus years of commanding or observing uh, troops in combat, we never knew of a single instance of an atrocity. Now, since we have come home, we certainly have uh, been made aware of uh, a number of them. Uh, we don't dispute uh, a single one of these instances. We're not questioning the veracity of any of those who have confessed or accused, we're simply saying that within our experience, this did not happen. Well, all right. in other words, none of you saw any such thing happen. None of you knows anybody to whom it happened, leaving the third category. You have, in fact, heard of it happening because it was reported elsewhere. Yes, sir. Now, can we deduce from this that uh, the incidence of these atrocities is therefore relatively small, unlike the public impression, which is that it is relatively large. I mean, did you know enough people? Did you travel to enough places? Did you, uh, were you enough in the swim of things so that you assumed that you would have heard about that kind of thing if it were a workaday affair? I think yeah. that, I think the first thing is to mention is when we went overseas, I think each one of us was told it's a platoon commander's war. It's a small unit war, and I think it really, it is in many respects, and one respect is the fact that the platoon commander, the company grade officers, are the ones that probably know more about what's going on right there on the ground than anybody else. In other words, and we talk about our knowledge being what's in our purview, what's in, on the ground there with our unit. And I think that what we're saying here is that within this, within this realm, that the platoon commander probably knows more than, it, than most people, gets information coming up from his platoon. As an officer, he's involved in the planning stages of operations, for example. He's <clears throat> aware of the situation better than just about anybody else here. Well, Captain Linda, uh, you would certainly call, say, uh, a grandmother who lived in a hamlet a non-combatant, wouldn't you? Now, are you suggesting that during the time that you were in Vietnam, you were not aware that American uh, bombs and artillery were used against hamlets and that uh, regular victims of that, those bombs were uh, or grandmothers. You must have been aware of that, right? I was aware that we were bombing objectives that as far as classifying what is an objective and at what point you can bomb a, a hamlet with grandmothers in there, I was not involved in that, no. Well, did you think about it? I thought about it. Uh, yes, I was aware of the fact that some of this was going on. I think I can also say, and, and uh, Captain North and I worked pretty much the same area, uh, that this was not going on at the time I was in the field in the area in which you were working. And I'll give you an example of this. I remember uh, a specific incident. Uh, it occurred on the 25th of June in 1969. 
And uh, we had a situation where in, uh, along the side of a stream farther north of the position where we were, uh, one of our companies in our battalion was engaged by a reinforced North Vietnamese battalion, obviously needed some help. So my company uh, was assigned to proceed north along the bank of this stream and aid our people uh, who were engaged to the north. In between the combatants and our unit attempting to reinforce was a village uh, with three lines around it. Uh, from the lay of the terrain and the situation, it was patently obvious that any enemy battalion commander would attempt to put a force in that village, or at least in the tree lines surrounding it, one, in order to prevent us from getting up there, the most logical avenue of approach, really the only available one at the time, and two, in an attempt to roll up the flank of the adversary had already engaged. We were fully aware of this at the time we went up. Uh, the area itself was supposed to contain no civilians, none at all, uh, in that all civilians had been theoretically moved out of that area. Well, what do you mean by theoretically? Ah, here's the rub. That was declared by the South Vietnamese government in conjunction with our forces, uh, an area in which civilians would no longer live. The people had, Is in that fact, what you call a free fire zone or not? I don't know whether that one was classified as a free fire zone or not. We were told there were supposed to be no civilians there. Yeah. Uh, these people had, in fact, been evacuated to a refugee camp out of the area. Uh, I'd say probably five or six miles away, close to the coast. Uh, however, it was common knowledge with all the forces in the area that many of the rice fields had already been planted and the people would come back in from the coast. So we were on the lookout for this. This town, uh, which had rice fields around it, or village, if you will, uh, was not supposed to be evacuated. In fact, there were no people actively living in the village. However, it was about noon that we advanced and the people had gone in at evidently to have their noon meal to get out of the sun in the village. And I would say there were probably 80 to 100 people, men, women, and children in this village. When what happened? I'll tell you exactly what happened. And uh, it, it happened frequently. I can tell you from experience. We proceeded up. Uh, <clears throat> we observed in the distance that there were some civilians in this village. The civilians of course, had heard the firing. Uh, it was a very loud firefight and uh, knew something was going wrong. Rather than advance toward it, they came south uh, toward us. Uh, we waited for approximately in between 20 minutes and one half an hour for every civilian to come through that village and pass through our lines before we commenced our artillery preparation of the area uh, in advance of uh, moving in and aiding our troops. Now, in that 20 or 30 minutes, I guarantee that American Marines were expiring for want of our aid on the spot. This was done as a matter of course, Mr. Buckley. We're, we're expiring where? We're expiring in the firefight, which we were going to reinforce. We waited for civilians to get out of the way. In other words, even though American soldiers died, you uh, allowed that length of time to go by in order to evacuate civilians. As That's what troops. To. Now, admittedly, I can't tell you that so-and-so uh, and so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so died, but it is obvious uh, to they me anyway they from the situation that if we had been there quicker, uh, fewer people would have died. Let's put it that way, fewer Marines. Yes, and we did wait. We stood on the edge of a tree line and waited until every one of these people went through our position, and then we commenced the artillery in advance. It, was this a typical experience, Captain North? Did you have anything uh, uh, like that? Is, uh, is this what you understood the orders to be in situations like that? That's, that's precisely uh, the way it was. And I, again, we can only speak from our own experience. And uh, as you have observed, we are cognizant now of times when this has not been so. And we certainly don't challenge that. But again, in my experience, this was precisely the order that was given uh, to units. If I may, I'd like to quote to you from an order uh, that was given to my unit. Uh, this is what came down from my battalion commander, and this is the portion of the order that I issued to my men prior to the conduct of an attack on 22 February out of Contient, what which is 1969. This is a, a part of the order that I issued to my men before we moved into the attack, into an area that theoretically uh, had been cleared of all civilian personnel. Now, we knew that there were civilians in this area, civilians who had violated the South Vietnamese uh, orders not to move north of a certain uh, river, in this case, the Cam Lo River. 
and they were operating, civilians were operating, woodcutters, farmers and the like, in this area that was theoretically cleared of civilian personnel. And yet, this is the order uh, taken from the order that I issued to my men before we went out there. Despite the fact, the declaration of this being a so-called free fire zone, we will continue our policy of firing only at known armed enemy on the conduct of this patrol. This was what we call a reconnaissance in force. We had APCs from the Army, armored personnel carriers. We had tanks. We had all the aircraft assets that uh, we could possibly use. And uh, to my experience, this patrol was no different than any other. Not a single piece of ordnance was fired at civilians who you could see in the area that was theoretically clear to them. They had no real right to be there, according to the uh, regulations that had been laid down for them by the South Vietnamese government. These regulations are, in fact, put there by the South Vietnamese government to protect the civilians. It's very difficult to, uh, to explain to an American Marine why there are civilians operating in this area where they have no uh, real uh, right to be. Uh, and yet, within my experience... Well, how do you define a right? Well, the, the, the right of... I mean, suppose uh, their homes are there. E exactly. Well, this is precisely the problem. Uh, their homes were there. Their mm -hmm. homes had been there. Prior to this time, uh, the civilians had all been resettled in an area uh, called the Camlo Resettlement Village in this uh, particular area. And the civilians were not supposed to be in the area of our fire support bases at C2, which was a position in Kantian. They were there. Civilians, as a matter of course, came through the trash dumps, uh, simply trying to pick up uh, items that uh, the Americans had discarded and they could uh, utilize. Uh, American Marines, to my experience and knowledge, never took ad advantage of this to fire on these people. Uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, I feel goes unnoticed because too often I think it's uh, been expressed that every opportunity is given to fire at anybody or anything that moves. Mm -hmm. Those weren't the orders that were given. And uh, as in the case Captain Carpenter has already cited, uh, there are times when American Marines probably uh, have died and certainly have put in, been put into extreme situations to avoid inflicting casualties on the civilians or non-combatants in the area. Uh, well, uh, may, may I ask you this, uh, either Captain Carpenter or Captain The, uh, as you know, a Senate um, a, a committee looking into the figures has uh, released uh, certain data which have been widely publicized. They are as follows, that 150,000 civilians in South Vietnam have been killed, 350,000 wounded, and 5 million made refugees as a result of American uh, artillery and bombing practices. Now, how can one simultaneously believe that report and believe that the kind of orders that you all operated under, um, how can one simultaneously believe in both? One, I, either you operated in a very unusual situation or the former datum is vastly exaggerated or there's an explanation? I think there might be a partial explanation. Uh, <clears throat> the area in which uh, Lieutenant North and I were working uh, was quite close to the demilitarized zone. In other words, the southern half of the demilitarized zone. Uh, a week prior to my arriving there, uh, the battalion to which I reported had engaged a reinforced regiment of North Vietnamese soldiers, fresh troops. Uh, as a result, uh, and this type of activity had been occurring in that area for some time, and as a result, the civilians uh, had left the area. Uh, now, I'm gonna, let me add something else here, why this type of thing went on in this area. Uh, the civilians in the area in which I worked uh, not only disliked, but also despised uh, the North Vietnamese. And I say this from personal uh, conversations with these civilians. Uh, on a day-to-day on -day basis, uh, in the latter part of my tour in Vietnam, uh, I was a civic action officer in the same area and uh, worked daily with the people. Uh, they wanted nothing to do with the North Vietnamese. The North Vietnamese were in the area, and as such, they left. Uh, the reasons for their disliking the North <coughs> Vietnamese were numerous. Uh, many of the people uh, had come south uh, during the period in which uh, Freedom Bridge, the name of the bridge at the Penn High, was open uh, after, during 1954. Uh, these people had come south across the bridge and had 
flop down the, in the closest place they could on the other side of the bridge. They figured they were safe once they got there. Uh, so that they were, had just been refugees uh, and had a fairly violent distaste for the North Vietnamese because of what they had encountered uh, prior to 1954. Uh, in addition to this, so there was a distaste here originally since many of them were refugees from the North. An additional problem was that whenever the North Vietnamese would shell us, and at the time we were taking uh, heavy artillery incoming, uh, rockets and mortars, uh, they would also manage to shell, by accident or by intent, I don't know, uh, the civilian population, which aggravated them to a degree uh, while they were in the area, making the area even less hospitable for the civilians. And finally, uh, we're dealing with, a, with an interesting sociological situation here because where the Viet Cong in the south may be my neighbor, and my neighbor comes over and says, say, look, I know you're shorthanded, but could we have a 10-pound sack of rice because uh, our squad of uh, VC is, is in bad straits? And I might say, all right, I'd be glad to give it to you. On the other hand, these fellows up here uh, are dealing with people whom they do not know, who are not their neighbors, uh, who are an armed force, quite well armed force, uh, dressed in military uniforms. And they come across the Ben High River south, and uh, the situation here is a soldier comes up to your house, whom you don't know, you've never seen the fellow, uh, and he says, give me 10 pounds of rice for my squad. Uh, this was a very heavily traveled area, so rather than him coming over once a week asking, I'd probably have a fellow from another company or squad on my doorstep every other day. So as a result, the area over a period of time had become quite uninhabitable for civilians, and most of them were out of it at the time. Those who were in it uh, were, as Lieutenant, as <coughs> Captain North explained, people who had come back He's in from the resettlement right. villages. Well, uh, it, what, what you were then saying is that uh, the, the figures relayed by this um, uh, particular committee don't take sufficiently into account the number of refugees who are refugees because they're trying to get out of the way of North Vietnamese or VC uh, um, harassment, right? I honestly think that has something yeah, to do with it. Yeah. I, I haven't seen the uh, basic uh, the, uh, statistics on which these figures were formulated. Yeah. They seem sort of extreme. Well. Um, let, let me ask you this, then, Captain Benson, to, to deal with the, with the last in this list of generalities. Uh, do you uh, agree or do you not agree? Were you aware or were you not aware that at the time that you fought in South Vietnam, uh, there, was a, there was considerable saturation bombing of, um, of hamlets, the major inhabitants, or the, m most of the inhabitants of which were members of the civilian population, rather than members of the uh, enemy military. OK, I can only, as, I, as we stated from the very beginning, in my experience, I never saw a saturation bombing of a civilian village. I, the only bombing that I was ever involved in was close air support, which I called myself, where we had airplanes that were responding directly to the ground. And we would run the airstrike through an air controller on the ground. And this was directed against against the enemy position which we needed the support for. And it was based on direct intelligence. We knew that we were taking fire from the position or something else. As far as saturation bombing of civilian uh, population centers, I certainly was not aware of that. Well, did you, feel, did you feel that you had the authority to call for air support against, let's say, a hamlet that stood between you and an objective if you had no direct knowledge that in that hamlet there was uh, uh, a, a possible military opposition, a machine gun nest or whatever. No, not at all. And I just go back to what has been discussed by my colleagues here, and the fact that when you moved out on an operation, unless you took fire or saw a man with a weapon, it was SOP or standard operating procedure as a military definition that not to fire until fired upon. And it's, I think it's something that, that we've missed too is the fact that when you have a man walking point for, or the first man in your unit has to walk and can see civilians in a village and he, he may not know for sure, he doesn't know for sure and he doesn't see a machine and he doesn't see the enemy, he can't fire until he's actually fired at, which gives, gives the enemy the advantage. And never did we call an airstrike or an artillery mission for that matter on a village or on a tree line even because a tree line normally meant there was a village there or people there 
unless we were taking fire from it, or unless we'd seen a unit in there, or were positive of the identification. We couldn't get it because we had to request it, and you request up the chain of command, and they had to clear it for you, and you had to tell them exactly what the problem was. Well, to what extent were you instructed uh, by your uh, superior officers in the, the rules of war? Uh, uh, to, to what extent were you told this is what you could do and this is what you couldn't do and the reasons for it? Did you know, for instance, about the Hague Convention or about the Geneva? I don't mean what you learned at Princeton. I mean what you learned uh, uh, in, in, in becoming a, an officer. Okay, when, you when I arrived in country, I arrived in the evening, was billeted the next morning, I reported to the 1st Marine Division and I reported to the adjutant of the 1st Marine Division, which is the personnel officer. Where? At, in Da Nang, right, yeah. in, the, in the rear area. And he gave me a thing called the Rules of Engagement, which is a pretty thick manual. You know, it's a loose leaf binder with a number of things in it. And he did, there was no discussion in terms of the Hague Convention or Geneva Accords or anything like this, but we were told to read this as soon as we got in the country. And he pointed out things that were specifically of note, such as, you know, civilians, the importance of civilians. Once you got to the unit, it was done again going from division to the next small unit being in the Marine Corps, the regiment, and then on down to the battalion. Each, each time, going to, as you're getting down to a platoon, which is what I eventually got to, I was, it was discussed what the standard operating procedure was in, in that area. Rules such as what time civilians were, la were you know, normally outside. They had a curfew. They had to be inside their villages at a certain time at night. They didn't come out until dawn, and of course we know that in, a certain, in certain areas, we knew this was not always the case. In a, in a larger village, people would be up, even though it was against curfew. But they, this is the kind of thing that we, you'd be told before you even got to the unit. But did you, did you feel that there was a certain amount of cynicism about this, that people were uh, executing certain formalities so that they could write down in their log that, that this had been done? Because, as you know, the general uh, impression uh, is that these, these, these rules are, are honored primarily in the breach. Or did you actually feel that there was some corporate effort being made to show you what you could do and what you weren't supposed to do in the course of conducting a war? Well, Captain North Los Angeles, let me just put one thing in here first. As the, high, the re more to the rear you were, and I'm talking about division, and then we'll go regiment on down, it was just a matter of routine, you know, telling you what the problem was. You know, here's the rules of engagement, you're supposed to read this, and, not, and it's not, you're not taking it. It's not very interesting because it's such a general thing. It's like, you're a second lieutenant, you're going to pick up a platoon, and he's telling you what our policy is towards bombing in the north, if you follow that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but when you get down to the company level, the battalion level, and you're moving into a specific area, it got very specific. And the, the men that, that talked to me, company commander said, did push on what, the, what village this was, what the rules were in this area, who the district was, what the district was doing. And I think that's precisely the point. You know, I, I, too often, and I, again, I, I don't mean to challenge any of the reporters, I don't mean to challenge any of the uh, investigators who have covered the actions of the Marines, of the Army, and the war, but too often I think it's overlooked the real command emphasis that a, a lieutenant colonel who's in charge of a Marine battalion places uh, on this particular matter. Uh, we could have, uh, or you could have, Mr. Buckley, uh, a Marine general or an Army general come down here on this show and tell you uh, what his specific orders were when he was a colonel, or you could have a lieutenant colonel come up and tell you. And I think it would be uh, massively disbelieved, because here's a man who, in the eye of the public, because of the way this thing has been presented, uh, is trying to cover his, uh, his tail, if I may use the vernacular, with paper. Uh, Flying in a helicopter. Exactly. Uh, I don't think that uh, we really understand how much of an emphasis is placed on this by the battalion commander or the uh, regimental commander who's out there on the ground uh, giving orders to the men who are leading the men. And if I may, uh, on a show that you had on uh, July 7th, I, uh, if I may hopefully correctly quote Mr. Hirsch, who was a guest on your show that night, he made a statement, I believe I'm quoting him correctly, that most lieutenant colonels who want to be colonels will hush up crimes. I think I've quoted him uh, correctly, and my apologies to him if I haven't. But uh, in my experience, again, I'm limiting that just precisely to my experience, I, I was commanded by four separate battalion commanders over the nine and a half months that I commanded a rifle platoon. 
every single one of these battalion commanders placed tremendous direct emphasis on the treatment of civilians within our area. It went so far as to describe the incidents Captain Carpenter has already uh, elucidated on. Uh, continuous uh, command uh, emphasis on just what the Marine in the field was doing when he came into contact with civilians. I don't think it was a matter of uh, trying to cover yourself up or, uh, or in this case I don't think it's a matter of hushing up because I've never seen that. These men were sincerely concerned with the welfare of the civilians in that area. And this covers all the way from the demilitarized zone where I spent most of my time to south of Anwa, which is in the southern portion of northern I -Corps, of the I Corps area where the Marines operated. But don't you, you, you have a certain difficulty because you are saying, I don't want to uh, question what these other uh, soldiers have said or what these other reporters have said. However, uh, it wasn't the way they described. Now, aren't you really required to question what they say or else? Or, or else otherwise explain uh, what they have presented to the American people as, as endemic. I mean, Captain Carey says that, uh, that war crimes are, are, are what, what you see as a matter of, of course. Mr. Hirsch, um, um, when he was on this program, talked about uh, uh, people in helicopters lassoing uh, uh, the other side, and, uh, uh, and, and he talked about uh, cutting off the ears of, uh, of the enemy. Now, what I want to know is, uh, have they succeeded, those who are criticizing the American military effort, have they succeeded in taking the, the normal aberrations, I say normal aberrations, even though it's a contradiction in terms, uh, the, 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 the aberrations that you would expect when a large number of people engage in an enormous endeavor, have they succeeded in, in magnifying that to make it look like that which has become conventional for the lot of you, or, or is it possible that you simply had uh, a rather extraordinary experience and, and were in fact shielded from what, what mostly happened? I don't think we were shielded. I don't think any one of us walked into this thing with blinders on. Uh, I wish we I, had been shielded. Well, you, you obviously <laughs> weren't, yeah, you obviously weren't well, shielded me, when you got shot. Me, me, but but, but, but were, you, were you shielded? Did, did it simply happen well, that you were surrounded were by followers of uh, Francis of Assisi? Here's a, there's three of us, and I, I think everybody knows the importance of the helicopter in Vietnam. I don't think there's any question about that. That your resupply comes in, it's where your food comes from. Your, your mail comes in from the States on a helicopter. Your medevacs are provided by helicopter. Somebody gets shot, he goes home by helicopter. Ammunition. I, ammunition. Everything. Everything comes in by helicopter. We spent three years in the field, to a greater or lesser degree, in the field being with a rifle platoon as a company commander, as an executive officer. When you live in the field, the helicopter is something that's very key to you. You look for it. You hear a helicopter, you can identify the type of helicopter, anything else. And I never saw a helicopter pilot going along shooting into a village anywhere near me or in, in line of sight. As far as I could see, I never saw a helicopter doing this. I never saw a helicopter pilot running along lassoing civilians. And this is what we're talking from. We're talking from this experience. And a statement like that, as far as we're concerned, was never seen. Now, this man, Mr. Hirsch, may have seen this or may have talked to somebody that has seen it. And we can't question that. But we can say that in our experience, I never saw anything as, you know, like it at all. I mean, it's, a, it's as unlikely as to say that somebody in the middle of an enormous celebration in Times Square in New York went up and shot a prominent leader. I don't follow yeah, the uh, <laughs> analogy on that. Well, that um, uh, it is objectively unlikely, but it might have happened. Precisely. Yes. Well, it possibly happened. He said it did happen. I wasn't with him. I don't hear this. I didn't hear the stories that he that he heard from the people he interviewed. However, when I, if, I if looked something, if something like that had happened, how fast would would the news of its happening have got through to people like you? Very quickly. It would through what Very medium? Quickly. Fact that you, first of all, you you have 50, 50 Marines working for each one of the platoon commanders. There, there's where your stories come from as far as rumors. When I first got in the country, for example, the rumor was that 7th Marines were going home that month. This is, <laughs> obviously, they didn't come home that month. I spent 10 more months with them. This came from the troopers. You know, the, one, of your, one of your Marines comes up and says, hey, sir, do you hear the Marines are going home? Well, this, kind of, this is the way that kind of a story would come up to us if, if it was a, and the, 
as a, as a platoon commander, you provide every kind of guidance that you can imagine in combat, I think. There's mm -hmm. a, you, you answer questions of every nature. You provide him with, tell him what, it, what he's going to be doing. You're his boss, his father, I think, to a certain extent, all kinds of things. Bolden at once. You would have heard that story. As a platoon commander, you also are involved in the decision making. You're involved in, in making the orders, involved in gathering intelligence and, and planning operations. So I think, as I said before, the platoon commander probably would have heard before anybody else, or as quickly as anybody else. Well, I think uh, in another way, now, now here we're talking about horizontal communication, in other words, amongst our, our own units at our own level. Uh, the vertical chains of communication, where we were, at the best of my knowledge, were extremely good. Uh, and as a, let, let me backtrack for a second to, to give you some background. Well, General this. Costa certainly hadn't heard about me live. No, he hadn't. Mm -hmm. Which suggests the vertical communication wasn't me. very good there, right? Surprises me tremendously. Uh -huh. Let me give you uh, an example of some guidance, and since both Captain Bender and Captain North have, have been at this particular school, uh, I'll, I'll see if they go along with what I say. But the uh, question always arises, uh, and in fact, it is, it is taught uh, at the basic school down in Quantico, through which all our young Marine officers go, in other words, our newly commissioned officers. What am I supposed to do if one of my men comes up and says, sir, I have knowledge of an atrocity having been committed. The only answer which I have ever heard given, and which is quite well accepted by the lieutenants, is that you have got to report it up the chain immediately. Now, why? Well, is that true in the infantry also? I'm talking about the infantry, sure. yes. This is a school in which we train all our newly commissioned infantry officers. Well, why didn't that apply in Milai? <laughs> here, here we go again now. You're, you're backing me into a corner, Mr. Buckley, and I'm, I'm trying to speak to the point. It's this that our objective in coming to see you to, to talk to this question this evening is to give our own experiences. We are probably, since I, I hope in, at any rate, that we're closer to this thing uh, in, in, in physical contact uh, than, I, than I hope you've been forced into, are tremendously uh, interested in the issue, concerned about it. Uh, we are probably in a much greater quandary than you are as to why these things did not go up the chain. And we are not here to question uh, why they didn't go in other cases. We'd like to explain what happened in our cases. Uh, I don't consider myself qualified uh, to question the functioning of a major general's uh, staff organization and his, his means of having information uh, passed up to him or passing information down to his troops. Uh, we're talking about a unit uh, of which I have no knowledge whatsoever, except what I've read in the paper. And a senior officer uh, who I probably would not question on by, because he's a senior officer in the first place, but also whom I know very little about. Uh, to get back to where I was going a minute ago, uh, the lieutenants, when being told of the necessity of, of reporting anything which might occur in the event that it does, always say, well, uh, sir, look, uh, what if... Uh, what if this guy saved my life the day before? You know, or, or what if he has done something which has uh, benefited the platoon, possibly saved the squad or, or the whole platoon? Uh, you know, here I have this, this debt uh, to this man and, and this close kinship. You know, what do we do about this? And the answer, and they accept the answer, uh, I'm, I can assure you of this, I think, is uh, if you do not deal with this problem immediately, several things are going to happen. First. Uh, if you just chastise this person, say, don't ever let that happen again, or if you just completely overlook it, it is going to happen again. Secondly, if you bypass this problem, fail to report it through the proper channels, the chances of it being discovered, if we want to be purely pragmatic, are moderately good. And as a result, that man is going to suffer, other people in your platoon are going to suffer, and you are. <coughs> so that to conceal is, is to lose from the beginning. Uh, the only proper technique is to report it up. I think the supplies, the attitude is the same uh, with the companies in which I operated and the batteries. Mr. Winston. Yes, Captain Carpenter. I, too, have uh, some problem with the seeming contradiction, as Mr. Buckley uh, spoke of it, between the figures of the Senate committee and your own rather empirical situation. Sure. Um, my, my question really is, is it not possible 
that as a Marine in Vietnam, since really the only thing that, that we can get out of your, your own experiences is why it, it worked this way with you and why it didn't work this way evidently in another case, uh, why, is it possible that as a Marine there is something special about the role of the Marine in Vietnam? Was it where you were located? Was it your training? Was it something that differentiated you as a Marine from an Army man? And perhaps is there something in that? I think you're opening a huge question, but one I'd love to jump into, uh, as, I, as I hope these two will also. Uh, I think the first, uh, going back right to basics, first off, we're all volunteers. Uh, when I signed my name on the line and held up my hand, I knew that it was uh, a definite fact, you know, unless I broke my leg or something, that I was going to go to the Republic of Vietnam. And uh, I believe both Captain Bender and Captain North knew this, too. Uh, we went into this thing with fairly open minds, and so did most of our troops. Uh, the training, uh, I think, has a lot to do with it. Uh, I'm sure you remember General Walt, uh, the recently retired uh, assistant commandant of the Marine Corps. Uh, one of General Walt's and many other people's uh, favorite and most off-spoken phrases was the concept of winning the hearts and minds of the people. Uh, we were constantly hit with this in training in the States, and it did not slack off, but rather in combat, in the field, the intensity of this idea being put across to us uh, was increased. Uh, I don't, uh, for these reasons, and, and I think many others, which, which you'd probably like to elucidate, uh, we might have been in a different situation. As I've said, I think uh, the area, in some cases, had a lot to do with it. First off, I, I don't think that uh, it's fair to, we, we've said indirectly uh, by not speaking to it that uh, we've criticized the Army. That was certainly not uh, any of our intentions. Uh, we certainly believe as Marine officers that we're just tremendous. Uh, we wouldn't be Marine officers if we didn't think so. But on the other hand, uh, what, what Captain Carpenter has said about uh, the training, the impetus behind uh, the Marine Corps has brought out uh, the incidents that we have had, and certainly we'd be uh, fools if we didn't think that we didn't have uh, our own share of criminals, our own share of people who don't uh, conduct themselves accordingly, and certainly it's on the record. There have been Marines court-martialed and convicted for uh, crimes against uh, non-combatants. Now, we're not saying that this doesn't happen. We maintain, however, the tremendous drive for what we called civic action in Vietnam, the tremendous uh, emphasis that was placed on it all the way down the chain of command, right down to where the platoon was going out into this village for no other purpose except to deliver medical civic action or dental civic action, med cap and dent cap as we called it. The impetus behind this thing coming from the highest level right down to that Marine enlisted man who was going out there and meeting the people was just tremendous. May I, may I just ask one, one further question on this line and that is, um, do, you, do you feel then that it is possible that because of the fact that recruitment for the Army and, and, uh, and, and other services might be of a less voluntary nature, number one, or number two, in those areas which are voluntary, such as Reserve Officer Training Corps, that because of the training and other factors, that indeed, contrary to the belief that the ROTC infuses a, quote, liberalizing influence on the military, that indeed it might be dangerous from the standpoint that such officers are not competent enough. He's going to say he doesn't want to criticize him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, here I am, a United States Naval Academy graduate, and I would leave this to my civilian uh, input uh, I was, right here. I think I it's was, unjust uh, for me to even try and answer the question. Please. I was not involved in an ROTC program. Uh, were you? No. You were not. In other words, we came straight in. Uh, I honestly can't speak the question, even if I wanted to. Uh, I assure you, I couldn't, I couldn't speak the question. Uh, as far as, as, far as uh, our attitude over there, I think one thing that had a lot to do with it, and uh, which I think we saw a lot of, was a tremendous effort from high levels right on down to the platoon level. Uh, and I, as I think about it, this was a very important factor. Uh, an attempt on the part of all the small unit leaders and large unit leaders to explain something about the Vietnamese people uh, to their troops, to a private, to a lance corporal. In other words, if you know nothing about a people, if we would assume that we snatch you out of the chair, put you somewhere where you know nothing about the people, uh, other than the fact that uh, they're different, it's very hard to say much about them. Uh, 
Uh, it's very hard to respect someone you know nothing about at all. Uh, I think that with a, a continuous program of what we called personal response, uh, it was the title of the program, and it, and it referred to the fashion in which the individual Marine was capable of personally responding to the Vietnamese. Uh, we attempted as best we could to explain to the individual Marine some of the people's customs, traditions, their habits, their attitudes, why they had the attitudes they did, uh, which in many cases uh, appeared on the surface diametrically opposed to the manner of, of, in which a young Marine might think. And once you can explain this type of thing to people, once I can understand your problems or vice versa, I think then our mutual respect rises, and I think that uh, we're going to do away with a, with a type of violent problem. If I understand why you have a problem, if your problem aggravates me, I, the chances of my running over and popping you in the mouth are greatly reduced than if I know nothing about it, the causative factors. Well, as a matter of fact, that's a rationalist heresy. But it's, <laughs> as Professor Van den Haag once pointed out, the people who reported their neighbors in Salem as witches were always the people who knew their neighbors very well. <laughs> it's a uh, point of view that was uh, it was brought into the old notion that familiarity breeds contempt. But anyway, anyway, I, I see what you mean. I don't mean to contradict uh, your, your I don't think it applied in this case. I don't think oh, we're well. quite familiar <laughs> enough to be contemptuous. Uh, Ms. Booth? Well, all of you gentlemen have talked about um, efforts of going out and meeting the people and bringing dental supplies to them and medical supplies, as sort of these great benevolent angels. And yet, I wonder, um, what do you think the citizens really feel if what they're really interested in is getting after the rice, getting their daily food, being able to cultivate their fields, I mean, how can they really feel about you if you're going through, tramping through their village, trying to save some, let me, let me you know, one. some Marines Please. that happen to be another mile away? I'll give you one example, and again, this is from my own experience on Tet of 19, what was it, 69? 68. I was also there in 69, oh, Tet yeah, of 1969. Uh, which I think was about February. Uh, I was operating in the vicinity of Dong Ha. Uh, I was in a civic action job at that time. And one of the things which I did uh, for about an hour a day, I'd whip down the town of Dong, Dong Ha and teach in the civilian school down there. Uh, I had occasion to be down there on the first day of Tet, which was a Sunday. Uh, I'd see someone about a civic action project. And I was shocked. Uh, we were concerned about Tet, the previous one, uh, 1968, of course, was, was the worst one, I think, for the entire engagement. And numerous preparations were being taken, but of course I had no idea uh, how the villagers would be reacting. I found my school kids, and this isn't a very pleasant picture, but my 11, 12, and 13-year-old school children standing, lining the streets as though they were going to have a parade. But the South Vietnamese government had distributed M1 carbines, Garands, Thompson submachine guns, and the kids were standing on the street on the first day of Tet, the holiday which we celebrate so happily, waiting for North Vietnamese to come to their town. Yeah, but That's isn't, how they isn't that what you sort of find? I mean, you, I keep reading accounts that, that really the people the Americans are afraid of are, are the small children, the ones that can throw grenades, the ones who look so innocent. So therefore, it's really not very incongruous, is it, to have well, somebody, a uh, 10, 12, 13-year-old, standing up there with a gun. If the North well, Vietnamese can do it, certainly the South Vietnamese can do it. On the, on the other hand, again, we're talking about now this area in which we're working specifically. And uh, we didn't have kids throwing hand grenades. The only kid I saw regarding a hand grenade was, was a child uh, which we got on Christmas Day at the children's hospital that we had established. Uh, who had both his legs blown off by a booby trap, which had been set up by North Vietnamese. The only child I ever saw with a hand grenade. I'd like to answer the question you start out with, as far as dent caps and med caps. We ran the same type thing, and I wasn't a civic action officer, just a regular infantry officer. And this whole thing was set up around their time. If we ran a county fair, which is one of the terms they used for them, we ran it during the noon hour when they were not working the fields. They took, they take a certain amount of time off a day. It's completely voluntary. All we do is set up the dental, say it's a dent cap, set up the dental facilities, and these people can come up there. There's an interpreter there. We have South Vietnamese with us working on it. They can tell people, and 
there's no one's required to come up here and get in line or come out of the rice field and come up and, and get this stuff. And it still is pretty good participation. Not only they, that. they want the stuff. They don't. They they're not uh, being forced to come out of the fields and quit growing rice in this country. It's not only that particular point about not forcing the uh, the South Vietnamese to attend one of these things. The idea behind the whole thing is to make the South Vietnamese feel that this is not the great and glorious Uncle Sam that's giving this stuff away, but it's the district or province chief, the local authorized government of South Vietnam. And uh, we don't go running around uh, showing the flag, if, uh, if you will. If any flag shows, it's the South Vietnamese exactly. flag. Exactly. It's the crimson and gold flag of the Republic of South Vietnam. We don't go around saying, this is what great old Uncle Sam and these fine American boys have brought for you people. We stress the idea that this is made available to you because the district chief or the province chief has asked for it. And here's the stuff he's gotten for you. Uh, Captain Carpenter, when he conducted his medcaps, didn't do it with the intention of going out and saying, hey, see how, how good we are? Now, that's not certainly the uh, impetus behind the whole thing. It's, it's kind of a, a basic structure of government attitude uh, to start the South Vietnamese off feeling that this is their own government doing this sort of thing for them. Mr. Winship. Uh, yes, I have a cap question for Captain North. Sure. Uh, you said that you have witnessed no atrocities against non-combatants, but I'm wondering about the treatment of known Viet Cong, because the mistreatment of prisoners also constitutes a war crime. Certainly. And uh, if I may, <clears throat> I think that uh, this is this is precisely uh, the issue that has come up several times in the past uh, uh, several weeks or months uh, since the. Uh, the, the vast public opinion against uh, military involvement or the military personnel, military personnel themselves admitting or confessing or accusing uh, uh, others of this type of maltreatment. I was fortunate enough uh, to take several prisoners uh, while I was in Vietnam, once on a specific mission to take a prisoner. Uh, I think it's a, a, a wonderful tribute to the Marine, uh, the young fellow up there who was actually doing the capturing or, or involved in this face-to-face uh, -face confrontation, that he made every effort to take a prisoner without even hurting the guy. And once this prisoner had been wounded, uh, because that's what the result in action was, this prisoner was afforded every uh, facility medically that we had available to our own resources. The attempt being to make sure that this guy made it made it alive. But did you ever yourself witness the mistreatment of Viet Cong prisoners by either American or South Vietnamese troops? I, I never witnessed, and I, I hate to think that anybody would imagine I went into this thing with blinders, and I think I saw a little bit of what went on over there, over the time I was there, but I never witnessed a single ear being cut off, a single round being fired at a man without a rifle, a single ordin piece of ordnance dropped at, on, or near a village of any type, or a single civilian being maltreated by either South Vietnamese or American personnel. That, is that specific, sir? I'd like to add something that uh, start by saying that the North Vietnamese are good fighters. Uh, they're good troops, they're well equipped, they're highly motivated. Uh, one of the reasons why they are highly motivated uh, is that they are told that if they are captured, particularly by Marines, and that I suppose we're supposed to be the most bloodthirsty ones or something, that they'll be tortured and killed. Uh, we found that with the prisoners which we got, uh, they uh, required no type of pressure under questioning. Uh, most of the prisoners, of course, having been wounded and, and, and are picking them up after an engagement, uh, they required almost no pressure uh, to be interrogated, no verbal pressure to be interrogated, and they sang like canaries. One of the reasons that this occurred was because they found themselves, and I have seen this again and again, flying out on the same medevac helicopter with a Marine whom they might have shot in that engagement. And when they reached the aid station, uh, the doctor treating them, one doctor treating the Marine you've shot and the other doctor treating you. This totally tore the warp and the woof of what had, what the fabric which had been constructed. But what about the South Vietnamese treatment of prisoners? I, oh, I asked I'm that because, sorry, I'm, asked, I'm asked that about, because the Geneva Convention states that no matter what country captures the prisoners, they are responsible for the prisoners, even though they may be incarcerated by a different nation. Yes, okay. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. I turned over every one of the prisoners that I captured to a South Vietnamese agency. Now, I didn't do it personally, but it was sent back through my battalion, and I could imagine <coughs> that after they were released from the aid station, back to the South Vietnamese prisoner facilities. A, a prisoner of war, especially in the way uh, 
we fight wars today is a political tool. A prisoner is worth much more alive than he is dead. Uh, the South Vietnamese naturally have a uh, very emotional aspect or very emotional uh, uh, perspective on this war because uh, they've been at it for a, a great length of time. And yet I have seen the prisoners come back uh, to tell, t tell tales, as Captain Carpenter has put it, time and again back to our interrogators after they've been fattened up. They've been healed. The South Vietnamese have taken care of them, and they've come back uh, for further interrogation to our uh, units to uh, hopefully give more information. I don't think that the, this matter is quite as uh, uh, violent uh, that, as it's been made out to be. I don't so, think the South Vietnamese, in my experience, uh, were quite as bad as everyone seems to think. Well, that Captain Bender, let me ask you this. Um, uh, we, we've heard now for the last uh, 45 minutes uh, you, you, what, what in effect is a flat uh, repudiation of that which we have all been told is the case over there. Now, I know that you're not anxious to criticize anybody, but suppose you tell me how it is that you figure that what you insist is a myth has become so prevalent in America. Okay, you're putting words in my mouth. <laughs> well, it's obviously a myth. If what you say is true, it's got to be a myth. It's, well, okay. As far as I'm concerned, it is a myth. As far as my knowledge, and we talked about this before, the knowledge of my unit. And we can't go into discussing what the, happened to me live because I wasn't there. No, I think that's a cop out. Look, if, if I it live is. in New York City and I say I've never been mugged, therefore there is no mugging in New York City, I'm intellectually responsible, right? Now, I don't, I don't have to go on saying I don't doubt the people who say they've been mugged. But in, 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 in effect, if I invite myself, uh, onto a program or onto any situation in order to say, look, I've never been mugged, <laughs> and therefore there is no mugging in New York City. Uh, I am actually urging a series, a set of conclusions. Now, you asked to come on this program, and I welcome you on it, you've done magnificently, but I ask you to be responsible enough to say, why is it that you are right and they are wrong? which you have only, unfortunately, 25 seconds to reply to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay, let me go. Quick. Can I do it? Yeah. All right. Uh, I think that uh, you, you, you just mentioned the fact that you're intellectually responsible. Uh, I think that there have been a tremendous number of accusations made over the media, various, various techniques, uh, statements made, but how many of them have, in fact, been investigated how many of them are confirmed? You said you're intellectually responsible. So you do deny Certainly. Them. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> 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 For a printed copy of this program, send 25 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205. That address again, Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205. This program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.